All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday to all you magnificent melon heads. It's my favorite time of the week, my weekly wrap up live stream. Friday afternoon is here. The weekend is nary upon us. And well, we are wrapping up the week, and it's been a pretty crazy week, day after day. New all time highs in the stock market. We had some crazy central banks going wild this week. Stock market is heading a little bit lower as we're speaking right now. Maybe a little bit of a sell off into the close today. We'll see what that closes at. Uh, but the big story, what I want to talk to you about today is the health of the American consumer. And earnings season is largely behind us now. You still every day we get a trickle of earnings coming in still. But for the most part, the earnings season is behind us right now. And there were two pretty consistent themes that happened in this earnings season. Well, three. The first one, if we'll count the banks, bank earnings were pretty bad in the first quarter uh, or fourth quarter of last year's earnings. The bank earnings were pretty bad. That was one theme. Um, the other one, obviously, the AI mania and the tech bubble inflating further. That continues unabashed. I mean, like just just bid Nvidia up to a thousand bucks already and get it over with, guys. We all know it's going there. Like so, any all you retail guys who are piling into Nvidia, you might as might as well just set your bid to a thousand because that's where it's going. Um, we'll see what happens when it gets there. Is that going to be a psychological reversal or not? But that's the other theme, the tech AI mania. But another theme that is gone largely unspoken in the mainstream financial press is what's going on with consumers, right? Because consumer numbers were really, really bad, really abysmal. Most retailers, especially the brick and mortar retailers, are posting mid-single digit same store sales declines in this most recent quarter, almost across the board. There was a few exceptions, and we'll talk about some of those exceptions and what those are actually telling us about what's going on in consumerism. Walmart, Abercrombie and Fitch, we'll talk about those. But almost all of them are seeing declines. And that's interesting because while those declines are happening, we're also getting credit card debt is running like the blazes. $1 trillion, $48 billion worth of credit card debt in the United States. On top of that, tens of billions of dollars in buy now, pay later loans, some of the most toxic dog poop debt the economy has ever produced. And that is running in the tens of billions. People putting everything from groceries to rent on buy now, pay later. I mean, that's like the joke from the, when you were a kid in the 80s, if you're in my generation. You used to joke about people putting rent on layaway at Kmart or something like Like, it's, it's not supposed to be this way. You're not supposed to need credit to pay your rent. And yet there it is. That's the state that we're at because the American consumers are broke. Average savings way down, median savings way down. Most people have no savings. And so they're running up credit cards and they're shopping less. Even with the, this explosion in debt, they're buying less stuff. Discretionary spending in particular has been brutalized here. People are spending everything they've got on their needs and there's just nothing left for the wants at the end of the month. Let's give a couple of these numbers here. Or, or some of the examples. Nike came out today. They're having problems with the consumer in China. All right, Nike posted a halfway decent quarter, but problems with the Chinese consumer, that's the wealth effect front and center right there, guys. The decline in home prices in China is making people feel less wealthy, and the studies, the psychology is pretty clear on that. When homes go down in value, people shop less, regardless of what their income is doing, regardless of what their uh, their, ass, their other assets are doing, their stocks, doesn't really matter, their bills, their jobs. The home goes down in value, people shop less every time. Lululemon, another one came out. It's pretty solid numbers for Lululemon. That's been a, a a growing company for the last couple of years. This you know this athleisure phenomenon. They they've been consistently growing, and they showed some more growth in this most recent quarter. But it was their guidance that came out this morning, where they really just disappointed the market. And most notably, management noted a shift in U.S. consumer behavior that began at the beginning of the first quarter. So. Even Lululemon, who has been like the superstar of retail for the last couple of years, even they're seeing it, a shift in consumer behavior in the U.S. And, of course, Lulu stock is getting punished for that. We got other companies came out today. Circle K, the convenience store, they noted declining sales, notably in the U.S. Um, also, especially sticking out from Circle K, lower diesel volume sales. 
not prices. It's independent of fuel prices, just fewer gallons of diesel being sold. Boy, that is a big problem. Fewer gallons of diesel, that means fewer trucks. That means less big work trucks, less cement trucks, less everything. All Everything bigger than a pickup runs on diesel, and some pickups run on diesel. So that's very bad for the U.S. consumer. Um, also, they were noting, uh, in particular, lower volumes and sales among lower income consumer spending, things like cigarettes, things that you know predominantly do well against among lower income people. Well, they are seeing big declines in those items at Circle K. People are broke. They can't even afford that kind of stuff. And one of the most hilarious quotes that I've read in a long time, the CEO of that company says, don't worry, that slowdown in the lower income consumer spending. They expect it to be, get this, transitory. I kid you not. Somebody after 2021 and 2022, somebody actually said the word transitory in a serious context. Things that won't age well for a thousand, Alex. Also, not to be outdone, FedEx came out today. Uh, FedEx stock is ripping today because they announced a $5 billion market cap. That's only a $66 billion, um, not market cap, I'm sorry, a $5 billion stock buyback for FedEx. It's only a $66 billion market cap. So FedEx is buying up shares. What are they buying up shares with? Well, the salaries of all the employees they just laid off. Not very good optics, FedEx, when you lay off people and then take that money you were paying out in salaries and use it back to buy your stock. That's probably not going to pull so well. Uh, layoffs and cost cuts drove pretty decent numbers from FedEx. But also interesting, even though FedEx just posted their sixth consecutive quarter of year-over-year -year declines in sales, and FedEx moves stuff. So see also the earlier comment about the diesel at Circle K. Well, there's FedEx saying six quarters in a row declines in sales. And I looked this morning, I could find no mention, at least no numbers associated with year over year, a quarter over quarter changes in package volumes. That's usually a very important statistic with FedEx earnings is volumes. And I found plenty of qualitative statements saying, well, volumes are relatively in decline or holding up quite well. No numbers, no year over year numbers. That was very suspicious in FedEx earnings. So the people who move stuff, they're not doing so well either. The people who fill up their gas tank, not doing so well. The people who sell clothes, not doing so well. And well, retail sales across the country, not doing so well, not keeping pace with inflation. And those are just the ones that came out in the last day or so, right? All, you know, you guys, probably a lot of you watch my daily live streams in the morning. Some of the numbers that have come out over the last couple of weeks, the same store sales, which is so important among retail companies, right? Because it takes away the difference between stores opening and closing. It's pretty hard to fake same store sales. Listen to some of these numbers. Kohl's negative 4.3% same store sales growth. All right, now keep in mind, guys, inflation is at 3.2%. So just to keep pace with the rate of inflation, you need to be showing 3.2% growth. Kohl's has got negative 4.3. Best Buy, negative 4.8. Home Depot, negative 3.5. Lowe's, negative 6.2. Target, negative 4.4. Seeing a pattern here? Mid-single-digit declines in same-store sales growth despite 3% inflation. By the way, that 4.4% negative number from Target, that was their third consecutive quarter of same-store sales declines, and they forecasted another one. They got it for negative 3% to negative 5% in the next quarter. Now, interestingly enough, we did have a few that were gainers. Walmart, same-store sales were up 4%. Now, right away, Walmart, remember, you need 3.2% just to keep pace with inflation and sell the same amount of stuff. Uh, so that 4% number is not really great. But the thing is, when you see more people shopping at Target or at Walmart, fewer people shopping at Target, fewer people shopping at Best Buy or Kohl's, that is people trading down, all right? That is more and more people joining the elite class of Walmart shoppers because inflation has squeezed them out of the stores that they were otherwise shopping at. And, you know, when you see Walmart shares, Walmart's market share growing, that is not a good indicator for the health of the economy. That's people buying whatever they can afford at this point. And also a notable exception to the decline in same store sales was Abercrombie and Fitch. I talked about this one a few weeks ago in my live stream. They actually saw a 16% increase in their same store sales, 
Why? Because Abercrombie and Fitch has more upscale shoppers and the wealthy are doing just fine because the wealthy own all the assets that are inflating with this asset bubble. The, the wealthy own the stocks, the wealthy own the luxury housing, the, leg, the wealthy own the gold, they own the Bitcoin, they, the wealthy own all the assets that have gone up in value. They own all the companies that have been able to raise their prices. And so they are the beneficiaries of inflation. And well, so the wealthy aren't taking the hit. They can still afford to shop at Abercrombie and Fitch. And actually, they're buying more stuff at Abercrombie and Fitch. So, you know, the average person can't afford clothes. They have to buy them at Walmart instead of Kohl's now. But hey, rich people can still shop at Abercrombie and Fitch. It's the best economy ever. Congratulations. Economic plan is working. That's the wealth gap getting bigger in real time. We can all see it. All the while, the talking heads in the mainstream financial press will tell you how great this economy is, how your problem is. You just have too many bad economic vibes, right? That's Your vibes are the problem. It's not your checking account. It's not your wages failing to keep pace with inflation, right? It's not taxes, government taking a third of everything you produce. It's not the rising cost of fuel, the rising cost of food, the rising cost of rent. No, it's your vibes that's the problem. You're just not seeing all the good that's being done for you. Forgive me for not laughing. Jeez. And so there's a lot of economic data to get through today, but why don't we shrink my big melon of a head and let's say hello to my man, Mish Damod, and take a look at what's going on in the markets today. Mish, how are we doing today, brother? I'm doing pretty good. You know, you were talking a little about, you know, upscale purchasing and McCarvey and Fitch. Um, so when we started doing this about two years ago, the the kind of the split between what they consider lower class and middle class was about 39,000. I looked it up two weeks ago. It's now 62,000. You have to make 62,000 um, to be in what would be considered middle class now. And, and it was um, 39,000? Yeah. Wow. And, and that's a change of just what, you know, you and I, we've been doing this since about January of 22, right? A little over two mm -hmm. years. Wow. Wow. So 39 to 62,000. And, and, you know, and we wonder why homelessness is on the rise. We wonder why squatters in, in abandoned houses all over the place. Wonder why Walmart's market share is going up. You know, I mean, there it is right there. So you have to make $62,000 a year to be considered middle class now. Wow. Yeah. And is that, do you remember, is that household income, individual income? It's a family of four. But what, okay. it, what it is basically is the poverty line has moved up. Probably it's typically double the poverty line, right? It's kind of the lower, lower classes. And that's kind of where you meet that. You're not having to um, worry about, you have a little extra income. That used to be 39,000. Now it's 62,000. What you do is you take the poverty line. So the poverty line has moved from 19,000 to 31,000 in that same amount of time. And, and keep in mind, folks, those are those are averages that Mish is talking about here. So averages. Central Florida yeah. is different than Central Texas. I got it. This is yeah. just the average over the country. Yeah, I, I can I can imagine like, you know, your San Francisco, assuming I have maybe there's like one guy in San Francisco who watches my channel and he's probably pounding on his keyboard right now. Sixty two thousand dollars is living. I can't even afford to live in my car for sixty two thousand dollars. You know, um, it, it really does vary wildly. Um, but that's striking how fast that's risen in how little time. And again, all the while, they're telling you, you're welcome. Oh, yeah, we gave you your stimmies and we saved the economy. You should be grateful for it. It's the best economy ever. You know, where, where are these bad vibes coming from? Uh, before we get into the uh, market recap, I just want to say thank you very much to Darren from Suffolk, who says, same here, UK inflation plus housing equals broke central. And, you know, the uh, Darren from Suffolk, thank you, sir, for the super chat and support of the channel. Your central banker there, what was it, Andrew Bailey, I think is his name, the head of the central bank, at the Bank of England. They were talking about the wonderful progress they've made on inflation just this morning when they left interest rates alone. So uh, apparently inflation is like victory is ours in, in, in England. I don't know if you guys feel that way, but there's a lot of victory lapping going on. And the last time I checked, inflation was still well above the 2% target and trending in the wrong direction. So maybe a little premature celebration going on there among central bankers. Thank you, Darren. 
Appreciate the super chat. And thank you, Evan Francis says, I have a feeling we're at the market top. So do I, although I've had that feeling for quite a while, Evan, I have to admit. Um, he says, notice how the S&P and the NASDAQ are at all-time highs, but NVIDIA isn't. They're diverging. Uh, yeah, NVIDIA is at an all-time high, <laughs> big time. Um, pretty soon, cue the bank failures. Uh, I, I do think we're going to have more bank failures. I don't think it's going to be related to tech. I think it's going to be commercial real estate is going to drive that. I think the banking system dodged a bullet with New York Community Bank. Or should I say they they insulated themselves, you know, Steve Mnuchin and uh, Michael Odding. Those are banking industry insiders who came and rode to the rescue to try to stop the fallout. So I think we haven't heard the last of that. Um, but, you know, NVIDIA is mid 900s. It's up like another 30 bucks today. I mean, that's on autopilot to a thousand bucks before anybody's even going to blink. And all the while, the analysts are raising their targets just because it, it, it's divorced from reality. What's going on in NVIDIA now at, at some point in the not too distant future, very soon, we're going to look back and think to ourselves, of course, how ridiculous this is. And all the people who are right now gloating being these arrogant a-holes talking about all the money they make, they're going to be the same people in a few months saying, I told you it was a bubble. I told you it was going to crash. Don't ever think these guys will ever for one second admit how wrong they were. Um, which, by the way, I, I have to admit, up until this point, I have been wrong because I've been saying NVIDIA was a bubble and that there's some accounting irregularities going on over there since NVIDIA was a $500 stock and it is now a 900 and change stock, soon to be a thousand. So, I have been wrong up until this point. History will tell who was ultimately right on this one, though. Thank you, Evan. And thank you, Mr. BTB. Ain't going to be reading that one. You got me on that a few times already. He says, thanks for the research, Jack. You are most welcome, Mr. Bagger. You are most welcome. It is my pleasure. I haven't worked a day in years because I absolutely love this job. Thanks to Living Our Destiny, new channel member. Welcome to the, to the ranks of the Melonheads. And thank you very much for gifting five channel memberships. Guys, if you received one of those gifted memberships, be sure and send a thank you to Living Our Destiny. I appreciate that very much. And welcome, sir. All right, guys, let's see what's going on in the markets here. We are uh, we are down to about 27 minutes of trading left in the day. And the Dow is down 262 points at the low of the day, about two-thirds of 1% lower. The S&P is down just barely six and three-quarter points or 0.13% lower um, just off of the lows of the day. And the NASDAQ is still just clinging to positive territory, currently trading at 16,420 points, up 18 points. Uh, I believe that would still be a closing all-time high here. So you know, a little bit of red today, but red from ridiculously high levels. So the market is still incredibly top-heavy. Uh, the big story, what I talked about this morning was this surge in the DXY. It's up even more now, up 108 basis points. The, U the U.S. dollar. Shout out to my cuz, Mr. Brian over there, who's doing probably okay on his Forex trades right now. Currently 104.49 on the Dixie. Uh, that thing just surging. The market is still digesting all these different central bank moves. I don't know where it's going to settle at. You know, if you had asked me on Wednesday after that Fed press conference, where I thought the dollar would be, I would have told you a lot lower than it is right now. So, you know, the market is the dollar is kind of defying Jerome's language the other day. But you got all those other central bankers who are even more dovish than Jerome was. So, you know, in a contest of doves, the least dovish dovish loses. And well, that means stronger dollar right now. Uh, looking over at interest rates, we got rates are higher almost across the board here. The 30-year, 4.392. That's up five basis points. 10-year, 4.217, up five and a half basis points. And the two years at 4.600. That is, I'm sorry, both of those two prior ones. They are down, not up. Getting my wires crossed today. But the numbers were accurate. The two-year is down 3.2 basis points. And the one month actually is green, up almost two basis points, 5.383 on the one month. Let's look at commodities here. Gold and silver and the other precious metals are not liking that strong dollar this morning or this afternoon. And even those lower interest rates are not enough to help the precious metals here. Gold is down 20 bucks, 2,164. Uh, it's come in off of those highs we saw a couple of days ago, but still doing pretty well over 2,100, but down 0.93% today. May silver futures, 24.83. That's down 17 cents, about two thirds of 1%. Platinum and palladium are both down roughly 2% this morning, this afternoon. It's not a morning live jacket. Get, get with the program here, brother. 
Uh, crude oil, May WTI futures at $80.79. That's down 28 cents. Gave up that $81 level today, down about a third of 1%. And Bitcoin keeps going lower too, down 1700 bucks Off the lows of the day here, these are daily candles on the Bitcoin chart. Uh, but it looks like still the outflows from the ETFs is the prevailing winds in the Bitcoin market for the time being. Probably that way for another month or so. And then the halving takes over. We'll see what happens after that halving, which is just 32 days away. Uh, now let's get into the uh, the meat and potatoes here of this one, the, the, the retail sales, the consumers. Let's start with this data point here. Year over year retail sales in the United States. All right. This data point came out a couple of days ago. Retail sales in the United States increased. So they're up by 1.5% year over year in February. That's following a revised flat reading in January. All right, so retail sales up 1.5%. Now, that might sound like a good number. Hey, they're increasing. But keep in mind, guys, these are based on dollar value of sales. And the dollar has lost 3.2% of its value during that same year. So, you know, if you adjust for inflation, there is about 1.5% or 1.7% less stuff being sold at America's stores. That is economic contraction. Now, we like to play with the inflation numbers to make GDP look bigger. So I wouldn't expect to get a negative GDP print here. But, you know, when you adjust for inflation, retail sales nationwide are down. All right now, we've also we've got the Amazon effect is going on here. E-commerce is still capturing market share from some of the brick and mortar stores. So that's going on in the background. But overall, adjusted for inflation, retail sales are down. Now, despite retail sales being down in the last month, the debt pile continues to get worse. You've probably seen this chart for a while here. Consumer loans and credit cards, other revolving plans, all commercial banks. This is America's credit card bill from the St. Louis Fred website. One trillion, forty-eight billion dollars in credit card debt. And let's, let's just zoom out a little bit, guys, so you can get a better idea of what this has done. Um, this is Americans going deeper and deeper in debt day in and day out without end over a span of decades. Look, here's where we were during the GFC. All right. You think people ran up the credit cards too high in the GFC? You know, when the housing bubble burst, we only had about four hundred billion dollars in credit card debt back then. All right. Forty percent of the level they're at now. And then, of course, you know, just explosions higher in debt. You know, debt never really comes down only during the, the uh, pandemic when nobody was allowed to do anything. So they had and then they got stimmy cash. Some people, smart people paid off their credit card debt. Um, but most people just took that stimmy cash and went and bought Gucci bags, whatever, you know, altcoins. Good luck with that. And now the credit card debt has been rising pretty much nonstop since the Fed started tightening or since the stimmy cash ran out more more accurately. Currently, one trillion forty eight billion dollars. Now, guys, the thing is, this credit card bill, like the sales, they're they're up less than the rate of inflation. So adjusted for inflation, retail sales down, credit card debt rising. That says nothing about the tens of billions in buy now, pay later debt and the auto debt that's rising, all the other debt levels that are rising. Now, here's the thing, guys. We're all still working. Uh, you know, look at the unemployment rate here. This is unemployment right now going all the way back to 1970. Unemployment is still historically really low. So we're running up these massive debt piles. We're barely keeping pace with inflation in our retail sales, not even keeping pace with inflation. And employment, unemployment is only 3.9%. Now, context is important. Let's zoom way in on this chart. All right, this is the last couple of months since the beginning of 2023. Unemployment is rising. It's rising ever so slightly, making higher lows and higher highs. So we are trending up. We're still, though, historically low, 3.9%. But it's going to go higher. It's going to go a lot higher. And, you know, I've made no shortage of commentary over the last few months about the quality of jobs, too. That's hidden in this chart, right? Well, let's zoom way out again. You know, while we're sitting here talking about unemployment being historically low, let's talk about the quality of jobs. We've lost millions of full-time jobs. And instead, we have gained millions of part-time jobs and gig work. So instead of, you know, middle managements or supervisors, you know, white collar middle management jobs, now we've got Uber drivers, we've got baristas at Starbucks, we've got OnlyFans, right? Like all this low wage, low quality work. And well, 
to the unemployment metrics, they look the same, right? If someone gets a job as an Uber driver to replace their job as the assistant director of sales at some Fortune 500 company, according to the unemployment stats, no change. But that man's quality of life or that woman's quality of life is drastically reduced under those circumstances. So that's not reflected in these unemployment numbers. But when you actually open up the jobs reports and you look at table A9 on those BLS statistics, then you actually see, oh, man, look, millions of full-time jobs going away, replaced by part-time. And, you know, un what, what's the term? Uh, Self-employed, unincorporated, which is gig work. You know, those are on the rise. People are trading down. Again, you know, used to shop at Best Buy, used to shop at Kohl's. Now you shop at Walmart. Well, that's because you used to be a middle manager, and now you're an Uber driver. That's happening. See, I'm, self, I'm self-employed and incorporated. Yes, we are. We are the self inks. Um, so, you know, yeah, well, that, hey, that's a good point. You know, like I, I left my middle management job in nuclear power, which was a very lucrative career for my very not lucrative career in YouTube. Um, I love it, though. Totally happy with the change. Wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, but, you know, that that was a, a big decline in income for me. It's, you know, I'm, I'm working on it, but it's, uh, you know, it's trading down. Jack's consumerism has certainly shrunk a little bit in the last few years. Uh, moving on, one more thing about debt. I wanted to point this out, and Mesh, you you pointed this out before, before we go ahead, on, brother. Before we, move on, before we move on from this, we talked a little about the U six number, and that um, I know you don't have it brought up, but U six is uh, a better because it underemployment also. Let's right see. So that's a better indication of of unemployment. Okay, so here's U6 unemployment. It looks like it's a relatively new data point. U6 is shown in red here. And yeah, U6 is at 7.3% right now versus 39 for the unemployment rate. Um, so also U6 is trending up. Um, let me zoom in a little bit more so we get out that big COVID spike so we can get a better idea. Yeah, they're kind of moving in lockstep here. U6 is higher, and it is moving higher also roughly about the same pace. And and U6 impl includes everybody, not just, you know, people who are unemployed. And guys who were the assistant directors and now drive Uber, those guys are going to be underemployed, so they'll be under U6. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense then why that's so much higher. Now, Mish, you also spotted this one before we went live. Um, shout out to my buddy Joe Brown from Heresy Financial. Um, Joe is in disbelief here, and I am too. I was pretty surprised by this. Let me read you this tweet here. Joe says, wow, I did not know this was true. Had to double check because it seems so unbelievable, but there it is. The median household credit card balance in the U.S. is zero. That's crazy. Over half, of 50, over half 55% of all U.S. households carry absolutely no credit card balance, to which I say congratulations. And surely that is most of my melon heads, right? Because we know when you live off the credit card, but then you pay it off at the end of the month, you're collecting your points, you're paying no interest, you win in that bank transaction as long as you have the discipline to not carry that balance at the end of the month. And it looks like a lot of Americans do that. That's actually, I was very encouraged to read this statistic. He says, for anyone wondering... That means the mean balances of those who do have credit card debts are high, they're growing, they're high interest, and delinquencies are rising. But the majority of U.S. households still have no credit card debt at all. Uh, so that's, number one, it's a little encouraging to know that so many people don't have credit card debt, aren't carrying a balance, that's good, but at the same time, Wow, that means only 45% of Americans are responsible for this trillion dollars and 48 billion in credit card debt. Uh, and, and again, that just speaks to the disparity between the haves and the have-nots in this country, how bad things are in the bottom tiers of the income spectrum here, just piling on the credit card debt. But that's where inflation hurts the most. And so that's where the balances are running up. And it's not just the debt. It's not just the decline in retail sales. I saw this one, and, and this is from The Motley Fool. Now, this is a, a little old, but it's the most recent data we have. According to this study on Motley Fool, the median American savings account balance is just $1,200. 
Now, real quick, guys, for those who, uh, you know, maybe didn't do so well in statistics class, remember median, mean, and mode. You've got mean is the average. That's if you add them all up and divide by the number of people, you get the mean. You've got the median, which is the middle. If you take the lowest one and the highest one, the median is right in the middle of that. And then if you take the mode, that's the most common number that appears the most. Well, the median savings account balance in the U.S. is $1,200. The typical American has $1,200 in their savings account. That's the median savings balance among Americans surveyed by the Motley Fool Ascent in July of 2023. So this is an old data point, and this is before that big surge in buy now, pay later. So it's a good bet that this number is a lot lower. Now, also interestingly, again, to speak to the wealth disparity in this country, the average savings account balance among Americans surveyed is 25898 the average is skewed higher by outliers who report having a large amount of savings relative to the median. So, you know, you've got that 0.1% of top income earners that has millions and millions of dollars in their savings, well, probably in money markets or whatever, but they are skewing the numbers higher, whereas the median where, you know, the people in the middle, they've got 1,200, but the average looks so much better. Keep that in mind when you hear about how there's all this savings or all this cash on the sidelines. Sometimes you hear that talked about a lot on CNBC. Oh, there's $6 trillion sitting in money markets. That's controlled by like the same 25 people. And that's not average Americans. People, the average person has no discretionary money left at all. And look at the trend here. Look at the difference. These are 2023 numbers, okay? So again, this is a little bit of an age data, but it's the most recent data available. But look at what the numbers were in 2022. Median savings balances are down from $4,500, while the average savings balance is down from 35366 when they last ran the survey in 2022. So the median, what, you know, what most people have, went from 4500 in 2022 to 1200 in July of 2023. What do you think is left now? If they went from 4500 to 1200 in a year, and that was eight, nine months ago, that means they're broke. Now, probably in the red because we know Americans spent a lot of money on Christmas because financial nihilism is taking over. A lot of people are just giving up and just running up the credit card, just saying, you know what, the hell with it. I might as well be comfortable. I know I'm going bankrupt eventually anyway. Just run up the credit card debt. That's going on all over the country. And uh, this trend was really alarming when I saw this, especially how big it was down from 2022 numbers to 2023. And again, guys, these numbers are falling at a time when most of us are working. The unemployment rate still hasn't risen substantially. And the Fed is sitting here telling us, you know, we don't think unemployment is going to go beyond four and a half percent. Look at this chart of all the previous increases in unemployment. It doesn't stop at four and a half percent. Not ever. All right. It goes to 6%, 8 8%, 8.8%, 10.8%, 7.7%, 6.3%, 10.0%. Uh, COVID was an extreme example, 148 All right. So the Fed is sitting here saying, well, we remain confident that we can achieve our inflation target while maintaining full maximum employment. We don't anticipate unemployment to rise beyond 4.5% before moving sustainably towards our 2% inflation goal. It's never happened. The soft landing has never happened. It's a pipe dream. They're, they're lying through you. They know that they can't beat inflation without unemployment going beyond 4.5%. And to be honest with you, the way things are going right now, I think inflation is going above their 2% target. It's going to stay there. And I think unemployment is going way above their target also. I think we're probably headed towards something Either deflation or stagflation is probably on the horizon, depending on how soon they turn on the money printers again. And I'm so a little was, uh, uh, taking a look. Hold on, go ahead, some, Mish. While you're pulling up the um, super chats, I, I saw a uh, curve the other day that said that unemployment really doesn't start taking off until you start lowering rates. So it's it's kind of one of those things where they lower rates because there's blood in the water, and then it gets bad. So we haven't reached that point yet. So, yeah, what was it? It's like uh, usually three to eight months after the first rate cut, you you typically get your big spike in unemployment. The last few big unemployment spikes—that's what's happened. They've come a few months after the surge. 
Right. Um, or after the first and it's cut. The same thing, it's the same thing we've been seeing, you know, just recently, right? The layoffs start happening and then they kind of start snowballing and then they start lowering. Well, the layoffs are already going and you can't just punch stop that. It takes a while. And yeah. we've said that before, economics is slow. So when they start lowering, they're already behind the curve. And also keep in mind, there's a lot of people, like all these headlines of layoffs over the last few months, those people are not showing up in this chart yet because they're still getting a severance. So that's coming. And we know the pace of hiring is slowing because almost nobody is hiring. Um, the job openings are going down. A lot of those job openings in the JOLTS report are fake anyway. So, you know, yeah, I, I don't predict good things for the employment survey. Although you're probably going to get great headline numbers and big, massive downward revisions. That's going to continue. Um, I want to say thank you very much to the God of Thunder, Raiden57. He says, the word you were looking for this morning isn't deglobalization, it's localization. I like that. Localization sounds so much more community-spirited. It's got a positive context to it, not deglobalization. You deglobalization, you're starting off with that negative prefix there. I love it. Look at the optimism from a melon head here. That is just fantastic from Raiden. Thank you, sir. Question. Who is the accounting firm for Country Garden? Ooh, sounds like a homework assignment for Jack. I don't know who that is, Raiden, but that's a good question. So you were paying attention this morning when you saw that story about Evergrande's seventy-eight billion dollar accounting fraud and how Price Waterhouse Cooper was their accounting firm. Let me see if I can figure that out real quick. Country Garden auditor. I don't know who it is off the top of my head. Uh, now I'm not, I'm not going to be able to find it without doing a little bit more research. I think okay, Country Garden appointed KPMG as advisor. Uh, was that for their auditor? No, that's for their offshore debt restructuring. I I got to take a homework on that one, Raiden fifty seven, because I don't have an answer for you. But I can tell you this: I'm going to put that on my monitor. I will have that answer by my morning live stream on Monday. All right, I am going to make the note, Raiden. Country Garden Auditor. Because that's a big one, guys. We had with what happened with Evergrande there, the biggest accounting scandal in history at $75 billion or $78 billion. And one of America's big four accounting firms signed off on those books. That is a massive scandal. How does an independent auditor sign off on a $78 billion fraud? How do you hide that? And how does any auditor who's worth his salt, manage that? Or did they just succumb to pressure? Now, I, I think it was a Chinese subsidiary that was owned by PricewaterhouseCooper. Um, but either way, PwC, they stake their reputation on that. So they've got a big problem there. And uh, that deserves more coverage than it's getting because the accounting firms are supposed to be, they, they serve such a vital role in finance, keeping these crooks honest. And case in point, you get Evergrande. When these crooks run amok unchecked because accounting firms are rubber standing, they're BS books, a lot of harm is done to investors. So it is so important that those reputations are earned. And, you know, PricewaterhouseCooper, you know, look, they deserve to have their name dragged through the mud here. They screwed up epically. They signed off on the biggest fraudulent accounting in history. And they deserve to be dragged through the mud for that. So... That's a great question, Raiden. I appreciate the super chat and support of the channel. I'm sorry I don't have an answer for you right away, but I will get you that answer by Monday morning. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. And Mighty Mike 53, he says real time employment 6.9 to 7.2. U6, it is. I think that's accurate. That's Mish's uh, number that we were just looking at, the U6 number. Um, that takes away things like declines in workforce participation rate, people retiring early. It's a healthier measure. Um, versus the whole population instead of some of the gimmicks that they use to make unemployment look lower. Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate the super chat, sir. Thank you, Nashville Pasta Man, who says, uh, when a $200,000 salary goes away, so do fresh flowers, car washes, hair appointments, chiropractors, massages, white collar salaries support all discretionary jobs. Downstream effects are real and inevitable. Out, outstanding comment. You're so right, Nashville. The, the discretionary service income is supported by those jobs. Entire industries that exist just because those people have that discretionary income 
And so there's going to be a lot more of those jobs are going to start going away as people can't afford it. Uh, now, right now, we're still not quite seeing that, though. I, I don't know necessarily, you know, some of these specific industries, but I'm going to just go back to those Abercrombie and Fitch numbers. The wealthy, or at least the 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 top 10, top 20 percent are still doing very well. So a lot of those jobs so far are probably safe, although, you know, flowers, car washes, middle class people patronize those things. Also, hair appointments, chiropractors, the middle class goes to all these things, too. And the middle class is getting wrecked here. So the more I think about it, the destruction, the ongoing destruction of the middle class is going to hurt all of those industries, too regardless of what the top 10% or the top 20% does, that shrinking middle being driven down towards the poverty line, is going to hurt a lot of those discretionary industries. Fantastic comments, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate the super chat, the support of the channel. And, uh, oh, I got another one here. Nashville Pasta says American accounting firm slash Chinese company. What I had read, I, I don't remember the name off the top of my head, Nashville, but um, it was a Chinese accounting firm but they're owned by Price Waterhouse Cooper. So, you know, they're they were part of the PwC umbrella. And so they have the PwC name, reputation, and firm backing them, but it was a Chinese owned or a Chinese subsidiary of PwC. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't matter. They were wearing the they were wearing the PwC logo when they signed off on it. So it was PwC, but it was a Chinese subsidiary of PwC that did it. I, I wonder, are we gonna see some of the big four firms may be divesting some of their overseas operations that they don't have a good handle on. That may be an, an expected outcome of something like this. But yeah, it wasn't, it was in that Bloomberg article that I referenced this morning. They did give the name. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it, it was a, a Chinese subsidiary of, P, of Price Waterhouse Cooper that had signed off on Evergrande's books. Thanks again, Nashville. Appreciate that. And thank you. Hey, Devin Bryan's long time no see, brother. Devin is back in the house. He says, what do you think about shorting KRE? KRE is the regional bank ETF. Um, you guys rock. I will tell you, I think KRE, the time to short KRE was a year ago. Uh, but that being said, I think probably we're still in pretty bad shape in, with KRE. The regional banks are the most exposed to the commercial real estate bubble. You still have un, uh, unrealized losses from uh, U.S. Treasuries. On their balance sheets there, you still have rising defaults in auto loans and consumer loans, and a lot of those live on the balance sheets of regional banks. The regional banks have had to get riskier as the big banks have gotten bigger, which means the regional banks are more exposed here. Um, so while I have no position in any bank stock right now myself or any banking ETFs, it's probably not a bad trade idea, Devin. I like the way you're thinking. I do think the regionals are in trouble here. Um, that being said, that fire, at least the immediate brush fire, was put out at New York Community Bank. I think they still probably have trouble there, but they bought themselves time, so it may be a little bit early. Um, but day in, day out, the losses in commercial real estate are in the tens and hundreds of millions. That's going to continue. We're going to see more bank failures this year. We're going to see a lot of bank failures this year. I don't know if we'll see the total amount of assets in bank failures that we had last year, but we're going to see more banks go down than we had last year. That's for sure. Thank you very much, Devin. Appreciate the super chat, sir, and the support of the channel. And thank you to Kaznika, who sends, what does Kaz send? That is a super sticker. Where is it? Number one. All right. Thank you, Kaznika. I am number one. I appreciate that very much. And is that Pharaoh Mirror from Lord of the Rings that I'm seeing there? It looks like it in the name, in the, the picture. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about some of these retail companies that came out today, guys. I want to. I I'm going to breeze through these because I ran a little long on my monologue. But let's let's talk a little bit about why the consumer is so screwed. What are we seeing in these numbers here? First of all, Nike. Nike share slide on lot, lackluster outlook and slowing China sales. All right, the the Chinese consumer, the wealth effect, houses going down in value means people spend less. Um, Case and Schiller and one other guy, I can't remember his name. They did a big study on that after the GFC. That is very much a real phenomenon. Stocks don't do it as much, but homes do. And Nike reported a pretty good quarter, right? And their ho holiday sales beat expectations on the top and bottom line, all that standard stuff. Um, but there's a couple of things here that say Nike is prudently planning for revenue in the first half of 2025 to be down low single digits reflecting a subdued macro outlook around the world. 
Well, that doesn't sound very soft landing-ish, does it? A subdued macro outlook around the world. That actually sounds pretty terrible. As consumers pull back on spending on discretionary items, there you go, Nashville Pasta Man. Items like clothes and shoes, Nike has spent the past few months focused on what it can control, cutting costs, and becoming more efficient, i.e. laying people off. In December, they announced a broad restructuring plan to reduce costs by about $2 billion over the next three years. They cut their sales guidance. They warned of softer demand in the quarters ahead. Two months later, it said it was shedding 2% of its workforce or more than 1,500 jobs so that it could invest, invest in growth areas such as running the women's category and the Jordan brand. So subdued global macro outlook, weakness in China, and we've got Nike stock down 7% based on that news. Not good for Nike. Now let's talk about some of their competition, Lululemon. Now, pretty good quarter from Lululemon here. Lulu stock tumbles after earnings. Why the shine is coming off the retailer um, Lululemon earnings topped expectations, but the stock tumbled after the company's guidance came in short of expectations. You know, they beat on top and bottom lines. Uh, the stock, let's see, what do we have here? Uh, it has been on a downward trajectory since management issued fourth quarter guidance that fell short of analyst expectations. Investors had been expecting more from the company that had seen its share price surge around 60% over the course of 2023. Concerns about rising competition in the athletic wear space softening consumer spending. Oh, there you go, the consumer again. Fourth quarter foot traffic, though, did increase 20% year over year. Uh, so Lululemon is still growing. I want to emphasize that. The company is still growing, but that growth is slowing dramatically. And uh, also they're saying, while America's grew 9% in the quarter, the management noted a shift in the U.S. consumer behavior amplified by a slower start in Q1. So Lululemon, though still producing pretty good numbers, they're saying so far this year, we're seeing some pretty bad numbers coming from their sales there. So close, not doing so well. Lululemon stock down almost 16% today. Um, and this is like one of those darling stocks from a few years ago. They were a COVID boom stock. You know, everybody was wearing yoga pants with, a, you know, fancy tops for their Zoom meetings. That was all the rage during the pandemic. Not so much anymore. Now check this one out. This is this was interesting. Circle K's owner shares plunge as earnings miss estimates. Talking about economic headwinds. Um, first of all, the name of this company is hilarious. I didn't know this. The owner of Circle K is a company called Alimentation Kushtard Inc. Ain't that a mouthful? Um, well, Alimentation Kushtard Inc., owner of Circle K chain of convenience stores, fell in early trading after reporting earnings that missed analyst estimates and consumers cut back on spending. The Canadian company posted a 2.2% decline in sales for the third quarter, while adjusted profit fell 65 cents a share, well below 84 cents a share expected by analysts. Kushtard declined as much as 8% Thursday morning. Uh, the retailer is dealing with near-term headwinds, especially in the U.S. market, Chief Executive Officer Brian Hanish said in a conference call. Diesel demand continues to be weak. And to me, that's a leading indicator of some soft, some softness in some sectors of the economy. I would amend that to say some softness in every sector of the economy, because there is nothing that diesel doesn't touch at some point. Every last corner of this economy has some kind of a diesel footprint. It, it either arrives on a truck or it's built in a factory with diesel generators or it's built by equipment that runs on diesel. Trust me, diesel is everywhere. And Circle K seeing a decline in diesel demand, that is a big deal. The company, which earns the majority of its revenue from fuel sales, said volume fell 0.8% in the U.S. on a same-store basis and declined 1.9% in Europe and other regions, excluding Canada. So it's even worse overseas. Merchandise revenue per store, such as food and cigarettes, dropped in all three of the company's geographic segments from the first time in more than 10 years. Stiefel financial an analyst Martin Landry, he said that in a note, but 7-Eleven's decline was even worse in those categories, which is reassuring apparently, and suggests an industry-wide weakness. I don't know why that's reassuring to anyone. On the convenience side specifically, it's hard to, it's really that lower income consumers that we're seeing strain today, said Hanish, noting the slowdown is transitory. I just love that. He said that with a straight face. On the convenience side specifically, it's really that lower income consumers that we're seeing the strain today. 
But that slowdown is transitory. Oh, my God. Who says transitory anymore? That is like a four-letter word. Consumers everywhere are feeling the squeeze of higher prices and elevated borrowing costs. So Circle K, not doing so good. But there's more bad news in retail. Or this one's not necessarily a retailer, but this one touches retailer. Along the same lines of that diesel comment from Circle K CEO, FedEx stock jumps after earnings beat, but the economy still isn't helping. Now, the reason FedEx stock jumped is because they announced a $5 billion stock buyback, and it's only a $66 billion company. So the company is going to increase their share price by buying back their own stock. Uh, but FedEx reported better than expected earnings, sending the stock sharp, sharply higher pre-market on Friday. The strong performance came down to another quarter of impressive cost control. The economy still didn't offer the shipping company much help. And again, you've got layoffs, you've got cost cuts being offset by a slowdown in global business. That's unemployment rising. That's inflation is still here. That's stagflation, guys. For the company's fiscal third quarter ended in February, FedEx reported earnings of 386 a share versus uh, sales of 21.7 billion. The street was looking for 346 on sales of 22 billion. So you got disappointing revenue numbers. This is the sixth consecutive quarter of year-over-year -year sales declines. As a year ago for the fiscal third quarter, FedEx reported $22.2 billion in sales. But it's also the third consecutive quarter of year-over-year -year improvements in operating profit margins because they keep laying people off. FedEx reported an operating profit margin of about 6%, up to one percentage point year-over-year. -year. And they're also announcing a $5 billion stock buyback and that billion-dollar buyback, that is why FedEx stock is up 7.3% today. Uh, so retail guys, just not looking that good. And all the while, remember, all these bad retail numbers, the decline in the diesel at Circle K, the decline in packages at, at FedEx, who didn't mention package volumes at all, by the way, in their earnings release. That's shady as all get out, in my opinion. That's while everybody is still working. And then we got this Chrysler parent Stellantis laying off 400 salaried workers, 400 salaried workers due to unprecedented uncertainties. Isn't that a double negative? Unprecedented uncertainties? Can't we just say precedented certainties? Anyway, but I digress. 400 salaried workers, that, white like, collar workers, getting like laid off. Of, that sounds like something coming out of China or North Korea. Oh, the unprecedented uncertainties or the precedented certainties? E either one. Pick your choice. But that sounds like something Xi or um, Kim would say. Speaking of which, did you hear the big kerfuffle about Kim's sister? She had a Gucci bag. And the uh, United States wants to know how if they're sanctioned. How did she get a Gucci bag? Mm. Well, I can tell you, if you go down to Chinatown in New York City... Uh, try to get out of that place without a Gucci bag because uh, everywhere you go, handbag, 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 you like, you like. Um, those things are for sale everywhere in Chinatown, and uh, they have a questionable degree of authenticity about them. So could it have been a knockoff? China, if there's one thing China loves, it's knockoff Gucci bags. I can tell you that. That has been made abundantly clear by my travels to New York. My God, that, that place is a handbag minefield. You can't get out of there. Um, <laughs> GGG loved it. <laughs> The first time I went to Singapore, there was a uh, a store there. It was four floors of pirated software, but it was sanctioned pirated software. You could buy anything you wanted, but it was just pirated. And there were people that are literally just burning CDs. You know, it was, honestly, it it's, it's just amazing. The wholesale theft of American intellectual property that happened in China for decades and nobody did anything about it. I mean, wholesale robbery, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars of theft of IPs, and we just let it happen. Nobody did anything. I mean, they, we were being robbed blind and did nothing about it. I tell you what, say what you want about Mr. Orange. He was the first person in a long line of muckety mucks who didn't do a damn thing about it. And of course, they told him he was crazy. And then his successor kept a lot of those actions in place because, well, they should. Now they're ripping us off. Um, but, yeah, that's also speaks to the uh, degree of, you know, how communism everybody shares. Do, do all the workers of the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, do they all have Gucci bags? Because everybody shares in communism, don't they? 
So does that mean all the workers have Gucci bags too? Or just Kim Jong-un's wife? Because, uh, right, it isn't everything wearing the tree in the nest and everybody shares in communism? No? Well, it, was, no. Oh. it was his sister. It was the sister, right? Oh, oh his sister. Okay. You know, Mrs. Yeah, Death? What's that? Oh, she's the one that she's the hammer in North Korea. She's the one everybody's afraid of. It's not him. It's the sister. She's mm. the one that signs all the death warrants. She is the Cersei Lannister, if you will, to uh, Kim Jong-un's Joffrey Baratheon, the uh, the one who actually does most of the executing and the maneuvering. Yeah, I mean, you hear stories, man, people being executed with anti-aircraft guns. and things. It's just assassins, own family members getting killed. What a mess. What a mess over there. Uh, one more quick one, guys. I just saw this one. Again, shout out to Macro Edge, who's been fantastic with uh, watching the layoffs on Twitter X over the last few months. Uh, another one, I, I wasn't able to confirm this one with any press releases, but Macro Edge has been, to my knowledge, 100% accurate with catching early the announcements of layoffs in the last few months. And he just a few hours ago said, Apple is reportedly cutting hundreds of jobs in engineering and research. And I'm sure that probably has something to do with Apple abandoning their electric car project. Um, you know, Apple has an innovation problem. Bigger and more cameras is really the only thing they've innovated in the last few years. Siri is a joke. And now they're laying off engineers and research. Um, so I guess Apple's going to have to uh, buy another company if they want to innovate because there hasn't been a lot of in-house innovation at that company and laying off engineers, engineers sure as heck isn't how you get it. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much to Kaznika again. He says, my strategy, buy one-month treasuries, which I am also largely still in T-bills, T-bill and chill. He says, take interest payments minus taxes. Buy silver. This works because interest rates are higher than increases in silver's price, and silver is suppressed and fixed. You know what? If the government wants to spend itself into oblivion and pay interest into oblivion, they might as well pay it to you, Kaznika, and if you're going to take those devalued dollars or those dollars that are being devalued in the form of interest payments from Uncle Sam and put that into sound money, I like the shiny. I got a little bit right here. Well, let me just say I'm Jack Gamble and I approve this message. I like the way you roll. I like your style, Kaznika. You know, interest rates right now are high, at least relative to where they were a few years ago. They are higher than the current rate of inflation. So you're still coming out ahead on the interest rate that you're earning and you're rolling that into sound money where your, your wealth is safely stored outside the financial system. Premiums are pretty low right now. So, you know, I, 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 th I think that's a pretty solid approach. Kaznika, your risk profile is very, very low. I'd say that it's a, it's a nice safe strategy at a time of risk run amok. And thank you also to Dan Hadeen says gas prices, gas price has gone from 289 to 350 in my area. Uh, I've noticed similar numbers in my own area, Dan, but U.S. petroleum stock has continued to rise week over week. Petroleum stocks has continued to rise week over week. Are we talking about oil inventory or are we talking about oil stocks here? I think he's when he says petroleum stocks, I think he's talking about inventories. Uh, look, energy is I think long term energy stocks is a fantastic trade. The indexes may take a hit at some point. The bubble's going to. Okay, I don't know if anybody can still hear me or not. Can anybody hear me? Let me know in chat. He was talking about um, finishing up here. Does anyone have any last thoughts before we go? Yes, we hear me. Okay. So uh, anybody got any last questions? I'll answer them real quick and see if he can come back real quick because he'll uh, try and reboot as fast as we can. Okay, well, everybody, 
Cheers. Y'all have a great weekend. Be safe out there. And we will see y'all on Monday. Ed, we're back. And no, I don't have a bag over my head, a blindfold covering me. No, the man has not come for Jack. Uh, <laughs> sorry, guys. Here, let me turn this down. My my screen went dark right in the middle of my stream. That is the second time this week that happened. Tech issues going to happen, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, everybody. I am amazed how many of you stuck around through the black screen of death that has struck my computer. But we're still here. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that very much. Um, thank you, Mish, for carrying the water for a minute there. Sorry to leave you by yourself. Um, Dan, what I was saying about your comment about oil there uh, when I was so rudely interrupted by electrons and uh, bandwidth and all that other stuff going on in the cloud is I think energy stocks are really probably one of the few safe bets I would consider putting money into right now. I'm still largely out of stocks, but I think ESG investing – is on its way out right now. I think there's a lot of pushback against ESG, and that has held a lot of capital away from the oil industry over the last few years. And I think the fact that ESG has kept everybody out of the oil industry, remember, oil is dependent on CapEx. It take, you got to be pumping millions and millions of dollars into poking new holes constantly. Otherwise, eventually, the holes you drilled a few years ago start to run dry, and you don't have new ones coming online to replace them. And I think right now, oil and gas are is really looking at a big time supply deficit on the horizon because of underinvestment that's been caused by ESG investing. And I think when that arrives, energy prices are going to skyrocket. And I think oil stocks will be a very good investment when that happens. Now, the asterisk I would put on that 
is questions around global demand. All right. There's still very bad things happening in the global economy. We were just talking about how people aren't using diesel, about how FedEx is moving less packages. So there is a demand side to this equation that you got to be vigilant of here. But I think the lack of investment in oil is going to come back to haunt this country. I think ESG is going to be a four-letter word very soon. And that's why uh, I think oil stocks probably not a terrible investment here, although any stocks I'm not crazy about right now because I think the whole market is just grotesquely overvalued. Um, all right, guys. Uh, oh, wait, I missed Grandpa also says, we appreciate all you do. Once had a fishing channel on YouTube. And the work involved was just too much. Grumps, it is a lot of work on YouTube. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, as you know, into making a YouTube channel. Um, so, yeah, that's awesome. And I love that you do a, a fishing channel. Uh, I love to fish. I don't fish nearly enough. I wish I did. And that used to be my job. I was a commercial fisherman in another life back in my 20s. Uh, most fun. I hope I never have again. So I do have a little bit of a nautical side about me also. Thank you very much for the Super Chat, Grumpa. I appreciate that, guys. Uh, thank you, everybody who stuck with the channel through that power outage or whatever outage that just was. I appreciate you guys sticking around. Thank you for the super chats and your generosity. Thank you to all my channel members and magnanimous Melonheads and Patreon supporters. Links to all that stuff down below should you feel so inclined. You guys are awesome. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. I love you guys. Everybody have an awesome weekend. Until next time, live small and dream big.